With Nietzsche on the death of God in the Fröhliche Wissenschaft, the gay signs. The third book of the gay signs is the book which tells of the tolle Mensch, the madman who tries to warn of the death of God. This book begins with an anecdote about Buddha, who, uh, sorry, whose shadow for centuries after he had died was visible in a cave. The shadow of the Buddha was monstrous and gruesome, writes Nietzsche. Right after Nietzsche writes, God is dead, adding that his shadow could still be with us, could haunt us for millennia to come. And we conclude, Nietzsche, we must still defeat his shadow. God now, says Nietzsche, is a shadow, a Christian God, that is. What is a shadow? Giordano Bruno writes in his De Umbris Idearum, Shadow is not darkness, rather shadow is the tracing of trails in light, or the sign of light in darkness, or the participation of light in darkness, or is composed of light and darkness. Perhaps it is both true and false. According to Giordano Bruno, a shadow is the vestigium, the tracing, the footprints of something no longer fully there, somewhere between light and darkness, with traces of both. For Bruno, shadows are necessary, also for memory. For shadow mediates, shadow tempers the eyes to light, as he writes. Some have lost their vision in trying too suddenly to turn from darkness into light, he continues, without using any shadow to mediate it. The shadow of God will remain with us for millennia, says Nietzsche. That is, flickering memories of the old ways of the Christian moral hypothesis, as Nietzsche calls it, will continue to be aroused and provoked for millennia to come. The shadow of God will be what Plato refers to as Eidolon in the Republic. Schleiermacher translates this word as Schattenbild, shadow image. The fanatic closeness to ideology I don't think is an accident. The ancient Greek word Eidolon means image, idol, apparition, phantom, ghost, shadow image. The age of the death of God, far from being a simple triumph of the almighty subject, human subject of course, over the divine, will be an age of idolistic possession, one of them perhaps being new atheism. Plato speaks of some poets as artificers of shadow images of Eidolon in Book 10 of the Republic, threefold removed from aletheia, from truth or unconcealment. In Book 7, Plato says that philosophers can govern the city well, for they are not asleep. That is to say, they are awakened to what? To the shadows they are awakened. More to the point, those who govern, they do so by means of shadows. One could also point out that ideology is a concept etymologically related not only to idea but also to Eidolon are both attempts to find something to hold on to, most prominently perhaps proclaimed by Karl Marx. And, uh, and you can think about why that is the case that Karl Marx provided such a, an important ideology, given the background that he has and given also well, what Nietzsche has to say about Christianity and its origins. So there's a shadow play that is now at stake, even more than before, perhaps, which turns the world itself into a spectral image haunting us. Ideologies give, even posit meaning and sense, also by providing a model of the world, and of the future by which to access the world and how to design the future. Yet meaning and sense are never something simply given. Meaning and sense must be disclosed and rested and twisted free. They must be drawn out in a continuous struggle. The title of section 108 in Nietzsche's The Gay Signs is New Battles. What Nietzsche then seems to foresee 
for the age after the death of God, which is inevitable, that we are in the age after the death of the Christian God, of the Christian moral hypothesis, those battles with are with are, are battles with and against shadows. That is what he foresees. So the in between between what is true and what is false shadows, which also mediate the new light of the coming epoch. Why though does Nietzsche reference Plato's cave, the death and shadow of God, together with the shadow of the Buddha? Buddha and Buddhism and Nietzsche often. There are markers for nothingness. There seems to be the uh, distinct threat that the nothing and its shadows are the imminent future. Das Nichts stürmt heran. Nothing is charging towards us. The nothingness. There is nothing that we can do to stop this. An inescapable dissolution is upon us, a terrifying paranoia, as the subject loses its certainty over itself even. Nietzsche writes in a note from his Nachlass, quote, Nihilism is in front of our door. Whence does this most unhomely, this most uncanny of all guests come to us? The shadows of the death of God, of the overcome Christian moral hypothesis and the ensuing devalorization of all values are manifoldly still present in the positings of new values which guide the world in Nietzsche himself. These values are also, and of course, in our talk today, the you know, defending our values, etc. Whatever those really may be. These values also always already predetermine meaning they come with a presupposed formatted meaning that is to say that these values give meaning insofar as they posit it yet they do not invite us to disclose meaning they are also assumed to be morally superior even though the anchor for all morality has been wiped away we remain christian what nietzsche demands with the transvaluation of values would be to abandon christianity as quickly as possible and as fundamentally as possible or else we remain good christians secular christians without the anchor for that morality the notion of hyper morality speaks to that insofar as the shrill moralizing prevalent today can only uphold itself against its groundlessness by entering into overdrive but hyper morality of course also means that it's a sort of a simulated morality so it, it, the intention here is to have at least two meanings it's hyper in the sense of it's shrill and it's exaggerated because it is groundless but it is also hyper in the sense of what Baudrillard would refer to as the hyper-real, it is a simulated morality. It also scientific and, science, of course, scientific truth values are no longer possible if we take seriously the death of God, insofar as God is also qua causa sui, the cause of itself, that which allows for any causal explanation in the first place. Much of the third book of the case, Science, intends to reveal the intricacies of the shadows of the dead God and the ramifications of this death, of all deaths, has and how morality now fails. Even the living, Nietzsche warns, is only a type of death and a very rare type. This is to say that even to account for what it means to be alive is now nearly impossible. Only in an ever stronger expenditure of force can the shadow machinery against total dissolvement be kept operating. We remember that the murder of God is recounted in the book, again entitled Fröhliche Wissenschaft, the gay science. Wissenschaft literally translates to the creation or the generation of knowledge. Tugend, virtue, no longer is the goal of the good life, but now it's Wissenschaft, science, the creation of knowledge. Two chapters before the madman, Nietzsche notes in the gay science that it is, quote, something new in history that knowledge, erkenntnis, or cognition wants to be more than a means to an end. Yet turning the creation of knowledge almost into the goal of history has a severe consequence of tearing open the horizon of the infinite as Nietzsche calls it which is also the chapter of the section right before the madman 
Therein Nietzsche tells us that we have not merely left behind dry land, that we have entirely destroyed it, as we are striding further into unknown lands. The ocean in which we are now drowning is infinite and, quote, there is nothing more frightening than infinity. Does he not mean here the infinity of absolute reason of the coldest goddess who wishes to create a plain, ever same world in her image, where knowing for the sake of knowing more without virtue is the MO. Nietzsche does not moralize here, though. He is clear that there is no more freedom on dry land than infinity. Our question is, how is it that God dies, that he is murdered? Nietzsche does not make it explicit. Still, the chapters leading up to the madman and the notes around the time suggest the following. The belief in reason and knowledge creation have torn open the horizon of the of infinity. That means the abyss. For this is not simply the ordinary critique which maintains that God, um, as the God of modern metaphysics would be referred to as the causa sui, uh, which required to have to have existence uh, proven, has broken away due to the efforts of reason. As is well known in the first critique, Kant wanted, Kant wanted to tame reason, even to deny, as Kant says, to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. Pierre-Simon Laplace presented a model of the universe to Napoleon, in which he no longer required, quote, the hypothesis God. Nietzsche does address the disappearance of this hypothesis, but also the disappearance of the of, that, of the God of the moral hypothesis of good and evil. That's a different God from the, um, God, the, the, the rationalistic God of the causa sui. So again, how is it that this God has died? And those who proclaim to live and evaluate according to the moral hypothesis of good and evil have lost their ground by the very, fa by the very faculty reason with which they now pretend to be able to judge and evaluate. Their valuing is a continuous avoiding, for it is ground and aimless. The god of the moral hypothesis is dead and killed at the altar of reason by the revolutionary spirit of the Enlightenment, which wants to know no darkness and hence becomes a force of the certification of Verwüstung. The groundlessness of morality, as mentioned above, sets morality into hypermode. It is important to understand that Nietzsche does not himself moralize against the death of God. Instead, he wants to think through what this really means and to take it profound, he wants to take it profoundly seriously. In a note from around the time, around 1881, Nietzsche is ever strongly, ever more strongly concerned with the death of God. And reason is here explicitly mentioned as one of the factors that comes in killing God. Yet not only reason is breaking out. Another crucial occurrence which concurs with the outbreak, let's say, of, of uh, reason is the historical feeling as something entirely new, Nietzsche says, a long memory which announces itself and is required in order to understand the world, which indicates not a benign change in attitudes, but something weirder, that's to say shifts in time, space and its fears. And why else would Kant want to tame reason and turn time into a mere form of intuition? Now this long memory now is the true nobility of the human being. Da wächst etwas ganz Großes. Something truly grand is emerging here, Nietzsche writes in this note. So this historical awareness, this sudden long memory, that contributes most specifically, I think, apart from reason, which is the ordinary story, to the death of God, because what begins to be seen are the inconsistencies and the contradictions, yes, so in terms of argument, but also something else seems to be seen, which is that this, the entrance of the Christian God into history can also let that Christian God disappear again or be removed again from history. He is a historical occurrence and event, and as such, he is finite.
So this note from the Nahlas is followed by uh, a note on the death of God in the Nahlas. So there seems to be a connection here between the new grand historical sense and the long and profound memory and the death of God. And this memory could also could mean that something now in modern man awakens, which was, well, I don't know, silenced or crowded over, was crowded out um, during the epoch of Christianity. Something more primordial, archaic, perhaps, is now breaking out again. Who knows? So in this note, Nietzsche also remarks on the harmfulness, though, of long memory and the strenuous path ahead required to incorporate it, that is to say, to turn it into a principle of life affirmation and value setting. Long memory is harmful since it means that the human being must learn here what our ancestors possessed. The task now, says Nietzsche, is to achieve higher gains, to counter the severe losses. So there's an economic terminology as so often in Nietzsche. Not only the notion of value, but also his accounting for and, and against losses, the enhancement of life, etc., quite often are spoken of in economic terms. So he's an accountant of life uh, enhancement in a way, uh, which is as terrifying as it should be to us. Um, that Nietzsche, who at once sees so far into the future, also continuously and, and increasingly towards the end of his life, he uses this crass economic language of quantification and accounting to describe the future, to describe our time, or to describe what is to come and what is also, hence, the rule of the will to power. The economic vernacular implies that the position of the will to power also always brings with it accounting in terms of values and their affectivity regarding the enhancement of life. Again, note that Nietzsche here in context of the death of God returns to the harm history will inevitably have. He returns to his second untimely meditation on the use and abuse of history. Whence, then, this long memory? Where does it come from? One could, of course, refer to the vast amount of historiographical data that's now available, which also requires to be ordered and managed and evaluated by an ever-increasing capacity of accounting. Yet, whence these historiographical data? That is the question. Why at all data of history? Data means givenness. Is history something that's simply given? Events that just so occur, of, of events that have just so occurred? Or is not Geschichte, the tidings proper, also always the task of thinking, being that is to say that we stand in a receivership and must actually uh, tell the story. The madman mentions Geschichte when he proclaims the enormous massiveness of the murder of God. There has never been a greater deed, and whoever shall be born after us will belong for this very deed to a history higher than all history thus far. Now, this is absolutely fundamental to hear this sentence again. There has never been a greater deed, and whoever shall be born after us will belong for this very deed to a history higher than all history thus far. So the history thus far would be the history, for example, most predominantly here, of the Christian God, the Christian moral hypothesis. So what Nietzsche sees, if the transvaluation actually does occur, is a lifting up to a history higher than all history thus far, leaving behind this finite history of the Christian God. This is the climax of the mad man's proclamations. While he does not explicitly say here how we have killed God, history again is mentioned in a highest sense. For the madman and the death of God means the destruction of the ultimate horizon in which meaning was anchored. We are now erring away from all 
sons. We are plunging in all directions at once, for there is no more direction. Quote from Nietzsche, The holiest and the mightiest which this earth ever possessed, it bled to death from under our knives. Yet the madman comes too early. The event of the death of God is still underway and wandering. The fact that this immeasurable deed is furthest removed from those who have committed the crime is the strongest evidence for the outer distanced coldness of the merely epidermally interested modern human being who so far removed from himself suffering unknowingly from frail nerves and self-exhaustion will only be capable of dealing with the most superficial in the most superficial way moreover the human being capable yet of killing god but entirely incapable of accepting responsibility for the murder or even acknowledging god's death that type of human being the last man will not be capable to accept or live through a stride through nihilism. To stare at the horror, to stare the horror of vacui, the horror of emptiness in the face, accept the consequences and transfigure this history into a highest, the highest history, that would now be the task. But I say this again, the reason why God has died is not just the outbreak of reason. There's something else that's breaking out, which is long historical memory that begins that is ironically how christianity begins with the entrance into history of our view towards an inevitable future of the apocalypse and judgment day which has now in some sense self-fulfilled uh just that judgment day is actually upon god himself and that frees European man to rise up to a highest new history. One that is also now, of course, has been made possible through the reign of Christianity, but must shed itself off Christianity once and for all. Or else we remain in weak pessimism. In order to achieve the highest freedom in history, man must stride through nihilism to build the bridge beyond. Something here seems to be occurring, which Nietzsche himself is not capable of naming, something which induces the historical feeling, long profound memory at this edge of an utmost limit of the longest today in the land of the evening, the Occident. If the last man remains in charge, that is to say, the irresponsibility for and indifference towards the death of God remain in place, then the desert will continue to grow. The future will continue to appear as a towering up of a black block from out of the depths of a horrendous abyss, for nihilism here remains incomplete. Only a strong nihilism, an active nihilism, can lead the human being towards accepting the murder of all murders, and that is the precondition to transfigure the ensuing darkness so that life again can be affirmed and justified even in the face of suffering but without hope for uh, salvation and without falling into hyper moralizing and the continuous attempts to administer and manage by the asymmetric distribution of terror the masses until the day the sheer horror looms so large when all that remains to the powers that be is the total devastation and annihilation of the world and the reduction and ultimately self abolition of the human being, which would be the highest form of weak nihilism. Thank you very much.